Yes, um, so we are gonna talk about today um, topic three, case for colonialism, and we want to focus more on the general debate about scholarly writing and what you can and cannot write and publish and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna just start off um, by saying that if you look at the debate surrounding uh, Gilly's pu publication, I think there would have been a great, great chance to um, carry um, his arguments into an academic discussion. Um, counter arguments could have been voiced and uh, in a manner that is academic rather than uh, dragging it out onto Twitter first and starting a petition. Because um, I think with his views, they are controversial and I don't agree with them. But um, could they then be used to actually create something fruitful? And I think uh, the scholars who engage in this petition and he, who refuted his ideas in a very emotional manner mm. um, could have maybe um, yeah, dealt or approached the whole issue differently mm. than just an emotional reaction to it. I think there would have been a great chance mm. to uh, make the debate about colonialism uh, more public. Uh, if you're going to talk about it going into social media, then it reaches people who are not within academia. Um, but now all it looked like was sort of an academic scandal. Yeah. Well, I agree that it should have maybe been kept, uh, at first at least, mm. within the academic world. Um, because it was published in, it was not just a Twitter post, it was not just a Facebook post yeah. or like written in a, a, you know, like a newspaper that reaches um, the general public. It was written in an academic journal. Mm -hmm. That means that it's an academic article and it has to be treated like that. So I believe also that the, the right response to um, his article was that uh, like also some of the readings uh, has that it's kind of like dissecting the article and his arguments and how he's like backing it and actually showing that he's factually wrong mm -hmm. and he's not considering all of history or all of colonialism he's like right. very selective in what he points to being the good stuff about colonialism and therefore kind of presenting colonialism as a good thing wholly mm -hmm. right and that's the problem because that kind of compromises academic work and scholarly work in general, right. uh, how you do research. So I believe that's a, a good response to it. And it should be the more scandalous part, or the more scandal part of it mm -hmm. is um, his actual opinion right. that he believes in colonialism, which is kind yeah. of, if you're a left wing, <laughs> For, or you're off that, like, um, what I'm trying to say is, becomes political then. Mm. Because uh, it's about his opinion, and that's where it's, it gets tricky Why, when you try to keep it within academia. Because you have this idea of scholars being neutral, mm -hmm. or like, objective when they do research. And I would argue, and I don't know what your take on it is, mm -hmm. but um, that you cannot strip yourself of your p political opinions because you have why, why are you even doing that kind of research you have a certain interest in it right. you have a certain opinion about it you have an argument you want to present so you cannot be neutral you cannot be objective wholly in within academia and where the, the clash happened here is that he's of a different opinion that other scholars mm -hmm. and that's when it becomes a bit like muddy and a bit like emotional because how can you believe this concerning this and that and it's kind of like then they're trying to wrap it within this kind of like um, scholarly arguments against his research you know what I mean mm -hmm. but what stands clear is it's actually it's a political opinion that's the main issue right uh, but then exactly but then my question is how do you treat um, scholars like him and how do you treat articles like him? Because then, um, if you, it is one thing to ask for the article to be withdrawn, which I think is quite interesting in itself and, and um, quite a scandal in itself as well. 
Mm. Um, but then you sort of push him out of um, academia mm. as well. And he is probably still going to have these views if other scholar, scholars do not come and, and engage in the debate with him. Mm. So where is he going to go with these views if academia doesn't want to listen to him or uh, even if academia doesn't want to have a discussion with him? Mm. Maybe he ends up in, in the more public space and in the more populist debate and then um, if academia can't be the space where you can uh, debate controversial things and if it's just going to get drawn into or dragged into the general media, then his voice is going to get heard mm. louder and louder anyway. And yeah, as I was saying before, I think this would have been a great chance for other scholars to actually strengthen the argument of why colonialism isn't the very fruitful and good thing or hasn't been. Mm. Um, and to make a stronger case for post-colonialism, yeah. I think, instead of mm. actually having given him yeah. more of a mm. space with his arguments. Also because like he's uh, criticizing post-colonialism mm -hmm. in this article mm -hmm. and saying um, they have not looked at this also what colonialism actually brought, but it's kind of like doing the opposite of what he's criticizing post-colonialism for doing, right. which is also kind of problematic, but um, I mean, I agree with you that he, mm. it, you shouldn't, by kind of withdrawing the, the article is not the right approach to it, because you are silencing him, you are saying right. that you do not have a voice here, and that's a problem because uh, even though he doesn't have a voice, he still has this opinion. He mm -hmm. still have these ideas. Where should they go? You cannot just like, you know, by silencing, just like uh, erode his ideas. It doesn't follow like that. He he mm -hmm. he is a scholar. He has his opinion. He would find other ways to, mm -hmm. you know, present these ideas, as you said, maybe to the wider public, and that mm -hmm. would be the voice, maybe, then, or it would be, uh, not in a ten-page uh, article journal. Uh, you know, journal, right. but it would be in uh, maybe two pages article in some kind of newspaper where you just kind of get the main idea of what he thinks, because that's the format maybe, mm -hmm. and then you just get this kind of like cheap version, uh, and what stands clear is just his uh, somewhat controversial, or not somewhat, but very yeah, controversial, controversial. <laughs> controversial opinion, mm -hmm. but some could buy into. And could be like, yes, and suddenly maybe it would be on the political agenda, a politician would start like, you know, far right would start saying, yeah, let's colonialize or whatever, mm -hmm. we don't want them here, meaning Muslims, let's mm -hmm. just keep them there and we can help them there. So, you know, I just to, to back what you're saying is that yes, it could like bleed into uh, the public in another way. And that's not, mm, I believe that's a bad thing because I do not agree with him. And I don't, yeah. I don't, I think the far right has many voices mm -hmm. and way too much power. But that's also because the fail of the left. And now I'm talking more political, but I think my point before is that you cannot strip yourself of your political opinion. Mm -hmm. So these voices are also clearly left wing, wing scholars. And and then you can draw a parallel between what's happening in the public and what's happening in academia is that the left is failing. Yeah. Then, if yeah. you cannot counter argument properly and just saying, oh, he doesn't know anything, or when it becomes emotional and kind of like these um, uh, personal attacks in some way, mm -hmm. then you just you just silence yourself like that. Yeah, and I and I want to add to that actually one of the articles by Khan, I believe, mm -hmm. um, she compares. Um, she compares articles such as Gillies that are um, that contain wrong um, wrong information uh, that misinform uh, to Trump and his uh, whitewashing and his you know twisting of facts. Um, but if we're going to talk about Trump and if we're going to compare another academic to Trump, then what this this sphere of academics are doing is they're having their exclusive circle, and if no one is willing to um, engage in, in discussion with him and, and take on these wrong, mm. uh, like these misinformations and, and refute them, 
then they're just pushing them out, out of the academic cycle, and now I'm sort of repeating myself mm -hmm. as to what yeah. I said in the beginning, um, but it, it adds on to what you just said with mm -hmm. it being very exclusive and... Yeah. yeah. And I actually, I think uh, we've been discussing this and we had the seminar and in the beginning I was thinking, why did this even get published? Like, it yeah. shouldn't be published in the first place. But why am I like, talking to people, um, fellow classmates and <laughs> you, <laughs> is that, well, I mean, there should be this debate. You sh you sh it should be because it doesn't function if you just say or it doesn't have an effect if you just silence these people because the opinions will still be there mm -hmm. and that's the main problem mm -hmm. so how do you deal with the problems because yeah. i think we're both of the opinion that uh yeah we do not agree with gilly at all right. and um but that doesn't mean that um uh, that he should just uh, you know again just be silenced his mm -hmm. voice should be heard, but we should the way we should counter argument him and kind of maybe change his opinion mm. would be to have an open discussion because he would probably feel frustrated if everybody's like shutting the door in his face saying yeah, we don't want to listen to you because you have a shitty opinion basically. Sorry my language. But I mean we don't want to hear what you have to say mm -hmm. because we're not of the same opinion. That doesn't that's not fruitful at all. So you should have this um, discussion, but um, how you deal with it, I still don't. I, I don't have a, a like a clear answer for that, because that's also the problem exactly. you're seeing with the left wing in politics now. And I don't have an answer for that. Also, even though I'm frustrated with people having these far right, racist opinions mm -hmm. that has real impact on politics and. Uh, and thereby also on people. Um, I think why I'm also a bit more um, reluctant to say anything about within academia is because you try to, you also want to kind of keep academic integrity mm -hmm. and kind of like keep within the academic language and the format, like, you know, that's, you're kind of like, you want to keep on reproducing academia mm -hmm. or the academic discourse and that doesn't function if you start you know, um, speaking very foully, or, you know, yeah. or, or um, attacking personally, then it becomes just politics, mm -hmm. and we're talking about academia, uh, academia right now, an academic um, like debate. Um, but I will still hold in my opinion that it's also political, and that's the problem. Mm -hmm. That's where it clashes for me: mm -hmm. is politics. Uh, or scholars' personal poli pol uh, political opinions kind of infused very clearly within academic work and where people disagree. How do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, because I don't think you can free yourself, and I don't think you necessarily have to free yourself on how, like, of course not having a political opinion. It's just, <laughs> yeah. Uh, how to do it? How, how to how do to, it? How to uh, also personally, because yeah. it's clear that I when I'm like now we've been writing some response papers in the last course, mm. and I clearly had like some, I mean my arguments came from what where did they come from? Well, if I look at it and I have to be honest, come from my political opinion. Yeah. How I view society. So, but that doesn't mean that I I should compromise with. Uh, how I do scholarly work. Mm. You know what I mean? Sure, yeah. Am I clear? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Am I making myself clear? But And it, it's not wrong to have a op political opinion. It's no, not, of course not. It's not, as a scholar, it's not wrong to write within a school or like, yes, I love Foucault or mm. I love, like for instance, me, I'm sort of a Marxist, so it's like, um, if I use, um, you know, Marx, uh, an analyze based on Marx's theory, um, that's totally legitimate if it's done properly. And that's where it, it comes like where it's easy to kind of discredit Gilly by saying you've done not done properly work. Mm -hmm. But then you have to take it further than, um, well, where does his ideas come? 
Yeah. I think like I'm I'm speaking blind now, but but maybe you should approach him in another way also like then also like on top of having this um, discussion about academic um, or scholarly work and mm -hmm. research how it's proper, also have the political discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, I think what it boils down for me too mm -hmm. is that. And we talked about this before, but we have this vision of or this idea of academia making having an impact on society and not just academia being within itself and reproducing within itself, only you know, getting out to a small fraction of people, only changing very little. And I think this is a good example for asking ourselves how that could happen. And then again, yeah, I, I, and, I, and I said this before, but um, with contradicting views, in the end, how do we deal with them? Can we get over ourselves? Can, uh, like left, can left wing academia, if I want to like, generalize the whole of like, left wing academia, no, but in these cases, for example, mm -hmm. uh, get over itself and get away from an emotional response and uh, think about you know, what chances this could also have for influencing society as such yeah. or, you know, asking ourselves if we do not allow debate with, for or with scholars that are controversial, then where will they go instead? And, and we said this before, mm. and how do we do it yeah. instead then? Mm. And I think for me that's that's what I take out of it. Yeah. It's, a, it's a question in the end.